This is part three in the three-part series covering netcode capabilities. If you haven't already, I recommend starting with the first video and work your way through the series. This video will review the tools for spawning network-aware objects and strategies for improving runtime efficiency with object pooling. It will also cover the technique for approving client connections and the benefits of using the Network Scene Manager for scene and object synchronization. Typically, to create a new game object in your game, you'd use Instantiate, but this only creates the object on the local machine. Spawning is what enables the object to be synchronized between all clients by the server. When working with networked objects, you generally use a prefab with a network object attached to its root. Then you register or add this network prefab to the network manager's list of prefabs. You can see this property here with my two prefabs I used in the game. Once you instantiate the object, you need to call spawn to activate it within the scene to enable synchronization. The spawn function also takes a parameter that lets you set whether or not you want the object to be destroyed upon scene change. By default, despawning an object on a server will automatically destroy it on all clients. In the case of a client disconnect, all network prefabs created during the session will be destroyed across the clients as well. If you want to prevent this, set the Don't Destroy with Owner property to True. This can be done programmatically or through the editor. If you want to despawn an object but not destroy it, this can also be achieved by passing false to the despawn function. You can also set, change, or remove ownership of spawned objects from the server to a client or between clients. This is helpful when you want a client to control more than one object or you wish to change ownership to enable specific server RPC execution like we talked about earlier. Another great feature is the ability to spawn a default player object. You can enable this programmatically or by dragging your player prefab over to the network manager's player prefab property. Then when a client is connected and approved, Netcode will spawn a unique instance of the player prefab for each connected client. This is what I use to spawn the players in my demo game. Player objects can be easily found using the network manager helper methods for both clients and the server. The connection approval request isn't part of the spawning feature suite, but I think it's important to highlight here as the callback can be used right before accepting players into this session. After you enable this in the network manager, you also need to set the callback like here in the code. Along with the main objective of approving incoming player connections, the callback gives you the connection approval response object, which allows you to set the starting position and rotation of the player prefab. There's a few other properties like whether or not you want to spawn the player prefab, or maybe you want to provide a different type of prefab, and it even allows you to defer the approval with the pending setting. You may want to use this, for instance, if you've set up player authorization through some third-party service like Steam, and you need to wait until the response comes back. In my demo code, I knew all my incoming connections were going to be approved, so I captured the player's designation mapped by their network client ID so it was easier to look up later on. You can leverage this approval function to perform any pre-connection setup that you may have. And finally, to wrap up the spawning section, I want to quickly touch on object pooling. The simplest way to spawn objects with Unity is through what they call dynamic spawning. This is a one-to-one -one spawning pattern where you'll have a reference to some prefab that you can pick and choose when you'd like to spawn or despawn it. This is typically for more individual object events, for example picking up consumables like weapons or potions. But for those multiple object actions, you'll want to use something more memory friendly where you can reuse the objects from a pool of ready-to-go game objects. You're saving the CPU from a lot of extra work by reusing pooled objects versus creating and destroying the same object over and over again. The objects are deactivated after use, then once another one is needed, we ask the pool to recycle one of the deactivated objects back into the game. Unity provides an excellent example from their boss room tutorial that can basically be copy pasted into your project as it generically handles object pooling for you. There's two classes in here, with the main one being network object pool. This tracks a list of potential prefabs for your game on the server, which can be set in the editor with a pre-warm amount. When you're ready to pre-warm the prefab instances, you can make a call to initialize pool. This is where the instances are created and added to the queue, hence pre-warm. It then maps a prefab reference to an implementation of Network Prefab Instance Handler, which is the second class at the bottom of this script. This implementation, which you can customize to fit your requirements, is what spawns the prefabs on the clients. 
So when you want to get a new instance, like here in my demo, when the player throws a ball, I make a call to network object pool, get network object, which dequeues it for me, and then I call spawn to activate it in the scene. But I don't have to make any additional calls to synchronize this object on the clients. Our pooled prefab instance handler implementation handles that for us. This includes both spawning and despawning. Each time a player clicks, I make an RPC call to the server to throw a ball, which pulls one out of the queue and is synced across the clients with whatever force I applied. The ball objects have an attached despawn timer that runs about two seconds after the ball is thrown. Once that executes, it gets placed back into the pool. So if you have someone spamming the throw button or whatever object you're spawning, make sure that pool size can handle the demand of the despawn delay. I found that 10 was a sweet spot and would always have an available ball to spawn out of the pool. So when you need to repeatedly use some prefab that has a short-lived lifespan, make sure to check out object pooling to keep your game efficient. And to tie everything together, let's finish up with a quick review of the Network Scene Manager. A major advantage with using Network Scene Manager is its ability to transition between scenes and have it automatically synced between clients. It also exposes the on-scene event callback that reports various states throughout a scene's lifecycle so you can fine tune the flow of your game. It's also recommended to use Network Scene Manager over the Unity Engine Scene Management as the latter won't give you accurate timings of the network scene transition, so stick with the on-scene event callback for network scene changes. I leveraged it in my server network manager script to initialize the pool of prefab balls when the gameplay scene loads. At the same time in my player controller, I also use that scene load event to set up the player's camera. Another benefit of using the Network Scene Manager is that you don't have to register every in-scene place network object with the Network Manager. These are the objects that you want to be netcode aware, but don't need spawn during gameplay, like a door, a button or lever, and even a heads-up display or radar. These toggle-style interface objects are considered static and are typically loaded and unloaded with the scene respectively. They still need to be netcode aware for events like when a door was opened, or for reporting the location of a mining node on the minimap. These network objects will be spawned and synced across the clients as they have been placed in the scene from within the editor. I can probably spend a whole other video talking about the network scene manager, but we'll wrap it up here. With this video, we are just dipping our toes into the netcode pool to get a feel of the available tools you have to work with. And again, read through the docs and experiment with some dummy projects first to get the hang of it. My last video on setting up Unity's multiplay for hosting and matchmaking, along with this review, should give you at least a solid starting point for building out your multiplayer game. Thanks for watching.